Next, we have the appendixes, starting with equipment. Here you have lists for everything concerning weapons, armor, gear, tools that you can find, that you can purchase in a game of Arcanum. You have tables for armor and shields. As I said earlier in the review, these are broad categories. That is, you have type 1 armor, consisting of heavy clothes or padded armor, soft leather. You have type 3 armor, for example, this category containing studded armor or ring armor. And there's also type 5 armor, which concerns plate mail, scale mail, laminated armor, etc. and so forth. You also have different types of shields, animal hide shields, copper shields, iron shields, and the quality does matter for the purpose of making saving throws, because armor and shields can be damaged through different magical and mundane ways. So you have a table giving you the percentage chance, indicating when an armor needs to be repaired or even replaced. So for example, maybe you decide to jump into the sea and you start to swim, if you are wearing clothing or padded armor, there is a small chance that your armor may be ruined completely or just a bit damaged. But if you are wearing metal armor, of course there is a higher percentage chance that your armor will be damaged in some way. You also have percentage values for when your armor is exposed to wet weather for two or more days, when you fall from a considerable height, or when you take too much damage, fire damage or uh, normal damage. And in the case of fire damage, it's quite logical, of course, this is the other way around. If you are wearing uh, clothes or leather armor, they will burn considerably easy when compared to scale or plate mail or even plate armor. Next, you have details on melee weapons with information on the weight, the damage that they deal, modified by strength, of course, the minimum strength you need to wield the weapon, the cost for that weapon and anything else concerning notes, special qualities or traits of the weapon. So you have different sorts of axes, knives, you also have some exotic weapons such as katana, you have different swords such as the bastard sword, the dueling sword, two-handed sword, you have war hammers, nunchaku of course for the martial artist, you have information on missile weapons with their weight, their damage, the strength needed to pull the string so to speak or reset or set the crossbow rather, you also have information on the cost, the ranges, you have a table covering ammunition, such as arrows, bolts. You have a table for the missile weapons themselves, such as throwing axes, a boomerang. You have different types of bows, long bow, short bow, different crossbows, and shuriken. You have throwing knives, war darts, and throwing sticks. Then you have information on siege weapons, such as the damage that those weapons deal, the crew needed to operate those weapons, the cost, ranges, and additional notes. So you have battering rams, heavy ballista, uh, different types of catapults, siege tower. You also have supplies, different goods and services that you can obtain with their weight, their cost. You have tables covering clothing, such as different sorts of cloaks, gloves, tunics, vests. You also have miscellaneous goods, such as candles, different types of chests, grappling hooks, lanterns, you have the cost of oil, pythons, rope, tents, a tinderbox, you also have leather goods, such as pouches, belts, water skins, you also have the cost of food and drink, such as ale, mead, a simple meal, a full meal, road rations, you also have the cost of lodging, such as cheap lodging, average lodging, good lodging, you also have magical and alchemical supplies, such as an alembic, beakers, blow tubes, funnels, prayer beads, quill pens, tongues, bellum, and different sorts of vials. There's also a table covering animals and livestock that you can purchase or sell, such as camels, eagles, dogs, a cheetah, horses, mules, ponies. There's also a table containing tack and harness, so maybe you want to buy some saddlebags, some leather barding, an elephant howda, a saddle or even an elephant tower. You also have a land transport table with carriages, ox carts, chariots, war chariots and heavy wagons. There's also water transport such as barges, 
large canoe, small canoe, small galley or large galley, long boats, large sailboats, and warships. Next we have the apothecary, with tables giving you the measures and equivalences. So for example, you have apothecary volumes by fluids, such as for example, 60 minims are the equal of 1 gram, 8 grams equals 1 ounce. You also have measures concerning solids, 3 grains equal 1 karat, 20 grains equal 1 scruple, 3 scruples equal 1 gram. You also have a ciphers table, very useful to decode or decipher different messages and sequences in the game. You also have an alchemical symbols table, perfect to codify those important alchemical operations. You also have astrological signs, a zodiac signs table with the symbols for Aries, Taurus, Gemini, Cancer. You also have planetary signs such as the Moon, the Sun, Mercury, Mars, Jupiter, and a magical scripts table featuring two alphabets which are perfect to write down those magical operations or to make sense of different scrolls and books that you find when making your magical research. Next, we have a section detailing alchemical properties. This section includes listings of materials used in various magical and alchemical operations. When purchased from a shop or guild house, they will be fully prepared and ready for use. For example, ground into powder or dried. The prices are the average costs and are subject to considered modification based on availability. Alchemists are able to locate and isolate rare earths, but may wish to purchase quantities to save time. No ingredient is available everywhere. The game judge should ensure that some ingredients are virtually impossible to obtain in a given region. This will aid in keeping the players active. So you have gemstones such as amber, agate, black opal, coral, diamond, onyx, quartz. And I really like it that the innate properties of these different stones make sense with some spiritual or mystical traditions in real life. So for example, onyx, which supposedly grants you good luck against all sorts of dangers, it grants you darkness and invisibility when it comes to properties. And in the case of quartz, which supposedly gives you clarity of thought, of mind or tranquility, it has the property of detecting illusions. Next we have a table covering elements and metals, such as copper, gold, iron, lead, and again with some properties related to occult philosophy in real life. So for example, gold is a magical activator, iron provides strength, and in the case of lodestone, it obviously has to do with attraction and repulsion. You also have a table containing all sorts of strange animal ingredients, such as a basilisk eye, bat wings, the horn of a devil, a gargoyle horn, ghoul tongue, kraken ink, mummy flesh, nymph hair, the pipe of a satyr. And each of these has different properties, of course. For example, ogre blood gives you the property of strength, and she hair gives you invisibility, sprite hair gives you charm. And what about the hide of a jetty? Well, it gives you immunity to cold. You also have a table covering healing plants and herbs, such as agrimony, amaranth, asparagus, balm, fumitory, gladwin, hellebore, periwinkle. And with their properties, of course, periwinkle promotes happiness, the self-heal plant promotes healing, wortle relieves fever, and wormwood is an anti-parasitic herb. There's also a table covering toxic plants and herbs such as absinthe, blackthorn, poppy, water hemlock, with their properties of course, for example, darnel is a mild narcotic, it causes sleep, the deadly nightshade causes death, you have purple foxglove, which is a mild poison, and the sneezeword, which causes sneezing. You also have a terrain key, indicating where you can obtain those herbs. Now, following those toxic plants and herbs, you have magical plants and herbs, such as the angelica plant, apricot, ash, clary, flax, hazel, with their properties. For example, caraway is an aphrodisiac, fern provides invisibility, frank incense is used in summoning rituals, and hemp can be used to detect spirits. Next, we have information on the setting for Arcanum. 
Back in the 1980s, the Atlantean trilogy was published. This series as a whole was created to be the most complete and detailed fantasy world available on the market back then. From a design standpoint, the Atlantean trilogy was intended to serve several functions. First, the trilogy had to work equally well as a complete system and a series of supplements. So it was conceived from the start in a modular format, allowing players to pick and choose the material that they want to use and add to their campaign. The trilogy itself consisted of Arcanum, which offered a wealth of information on magic and alchemy. It contained nearly 500 spells, 27 character classes, several player character races, an expanded listing on runes, symbols, magical scripts, as well as magic and combat systems. Arcanum itself could be used as a complete fantasy role-playing game, despite its modular nature. The second volume was Lexicon. It worked as the complete atlas of the Antediluvian Age, the main setting for Arcanum. It contained detailed maps of the legendary continents, countries and cities of the Atlantean world, plus information on trade routes, the history of Atlantis, the first and second ages of Atlantis, and much more. The third book was The Beast Theory, and it was a compendium of the fantastic beings and creatures of the Atlantean Age. It contained over 300 different entries, including the hierarchies of devils, demons, rare and unusual mythical beasts, non-human races, etc. So that explains the extensive beast theory contained in this core rulebook. Now, the second most important design consideration for the Atlantean trilogy was ease of play. So despite being designed almost exclusively for experienced gamers, the mechanics of both the combat and magic systems were simple to learn and fast playing, allowing players and game judges to spend more time role playing and less time rolling dice and consulting charts. Which leads to the third objective of the Atlantean trilogy, which is to present the players and the game judge with a deep, rich and believable fantasy world in which to adventure. There is a combination of both history, myth and legend. So they took inspiration from Plato, Kais, Spence, The Camp, Churchward, and many others. So the Atlantean world is a mix of fiction, legends, some historical hints mixed together to create this amazing extensive fantasy setting. So the Atlantean world presented in this core rulebook is intended for use by both players and game judges who would like to run an Atlantean campaign. Arcanum's default setting assumes a period of Earth's ancient past known as the Second Age. This mythical period took place between 15,000 BC and 12,000 BC. Because this age came to an end at the time of the Great Flood, this period is often referred to as the Pre-Flood or the Antediluvian Age. Now, not all of the species and races are compatible officially with the setting, that is most of them are, but some of them could seem out of place. However, this is your version of the Atlantean setting. So if you like those species and races inserted into your campaign, there's nothing stopping you from including them. Then we have information on the different areas and zones of the antediluvian lands. For example, Atlantis. Although the fabled first kingdom of men once colonized and ruled much of the known world, during the period known as the First Age, Second Age Atlantis is generally considered to be an empire in decline. The Great Cataclysm, which brought an end to the Halcyon First Age, also caused the collapse of the mighty Atlantean Empire. Then we have Antilla. Antilla is less a continent than a gigantic mass of vegetation deposited by ocean currents around a chain of small islands. We also have Alva and Iver which is England and Ireland. Known as the Fairy Isles, these two islands are home to the races of fairy folk known as the She. We have Anostos, which is inhabited by an evil race of giants known as the Fomorians. Then there's the Erie, which is North America. This continent is the home of the red-skinned Aryan peoples. Then we have Gondwana, which would be Africa. The vast continent of Gondwana is home to many different cultures, including the kingdoms of Ophir and Kadan. Then we have Hesperia, which is the land of the Amazons, a race of women warriors renowned for their courage and skill in battle. 
Then we have Hyperborea. This is the native land of both the dwarves and the trolls. Generations of warring over the ore-rich Raytheon Mountains have weakened these two ancient races. And this allowed the Cimmerians and the Vanir to establish themselves here. You also have Jambu, which is Asia. The continent of Jambu is home to many different peoples and to the advanced cultures of Hittai, Dravidia, and Himvati. Then we have Jotunland. This frozen wasteland is inhabited by the Jotun, a warlike race of frost giants. Then we have Lemuria. Lemuria is a vast continent of jungle and volcanic rock. It is inhabited by the ape-like Lemures. Then we have Mediterranean. This is the native land of the once powerful goblin races, most of whom now dwell only in the Black Forest. Then we have Mu. This is a desolate continent, inhabited mainly by the Naga, the Serpent Men, and their avian rivals, the Zephyr. Then we have Tamo Anshan. This is known as the Land of Mists. It was once occupied by the Atlantean people. In its jungles are said to be the ruins of several First Age cities, long since abandoned by their Atlantean builders. And this is just a bit of information concerning each of the lands and zones. You do not have extensive information on each of the cities, the towns, you just have a general outline for different regions, different continents and their dwellers, but it's enough information to start a campaign and to further develop things. Then we have details on the different races that live in this age, such as the Aesir, which are found in certain hilly and mountainous regions throughout the known world. Then we have the Andaman, believed to be creations of the Atlantean sorcerers of the First Age. We also have dwarves, which are the most civilized of the subterranean races and are amongst the oldest of the humanoid peoples. There are also the elves. Although they were quite numerous during the First Age, the elves have slowly dwindled in the face of human expansion. Now, halflings and gnomes do not fit into the setting officially, but you can introduce them if you want, of course. Now, when it comes to the nethermen, the majority of them are descended from the hybrid stock created by the Atlantean sorcerers of the First Age. Then we have the Selkie, which are extremely rare creatures, usually resulting from a triton taking a liking to a human. And then we have the Zephyr, which are native to the dark continent of Mu, and certain isolated areas of Lemuria. Never great in number, the Zephyr population has steadily dwindled since the first cataclysm. We also have information on backgrounds, the place of birth. Once you choose a background for your character, a place of birth is established, and they give you different examples. If your character is an aristocrat, maybe that character comes from Avalon or Atlantis. If you are a barbarian, maybe you come from Hyperborea or Northern Hittai. If you are a city dweller, maybe you come from Kafir or Tartessos. An outcast comes from any region. And if you are a villager, maybe you come from the Mediterranean coast or the Aryan coast. You also have information on the type of equipment that you can purchase in this setting. For example, in the Atlantean world, only elves and dwarves know how to make chain mail. Plate armor is extremely rare. You also have information on languages. You have human languages such as the Hyperborean language, the Mediterranean language. When it comes to non-human languages, you have the Asir language, ancient language, high elven, sylvan language, and special languages such as animal languages and the Thibs Cant. I also really like the character sheet and the spell cards. You have this way to organize your spells in small cards so that they are readily available during play and your character sheet has everything well organized, quite neat. And I also like the aesthetic aspect of the sheet. Now, at the very end of the book, there is a very interesting, very cool section, which is the designer's notes appendix. K. David, who is the current owner of the intellectual property known as Arcanum, shares his thoughts, opinions and reasonings behind different mechanics and inner workings of Arcanum. So you have information on the attributes, on the different design choices concerning strength, dexterity, charisma, you have information on hit points, the rationale behind saving throws, experience points, race and profession combinations, a skill versus highly trained when it comes to combat, 
abilities and skills, professions and race combinations, different sorts of skills divided by common abilities, how to perform skills, universal skill resolution. You have details here on what things were preserved and what things were slightly modified for this current edition of Arcanum. You also have information on combat, magic, spell names, the modification and addition of spells, equipment, advanced practices details concerning runes and venoms, some things were better organized and added to add legitimacy and more believability to both the system and the setting. What I really like of this designer's notes section is that the author raises many questions, he provides some answers, but he never dictates the final answer or the final outcome for each of these questions. He creates a discussion and leaves you to your own thoughts. He encourages you to reach your own conclusion. So this section is going to be very interesting for those that are interested in the inner workings of a role-playing game. So what do I think of Arcanum 30th Anniversary Edition? This is one of the greatest old-school fantasy role-playing games that you can play. Everything about the book is so great, so complete. Perhaps the only thing that could be considered missing is a dedicated or specialized section for the game judge. A section that tells you how to run an adventure and a complete campaign of Arcanum. You do have basic information at the start of the book, but I think that someone who is a complete beginner for role-playing games will need additional research, will need to watch some YouTube videos, perhaps read different websites, perhaps play a game or two with a more experienced group. But if you already know how to play a role-playing game, such a section would be unnecessary. But everything else about Arcanum is just so robust, detailed. The introduction does a great job presenting the book, the game system, the setting for an experienced role player, as well as giving you interesting details concerning the history and background of Arcanum. When it comes to character creation, you have so many professions, species, races, backgrounds. You can create many characters throughout your entire gaming career. And I think you will always feel eager to explore the different possibilities of races and profession combinations, as well as background and any spells and weapons that you can find. Each character will feel quite unique. Now when it comes to a system of skills, it's quite versatile, flexible, and I really like it that they allow you to train in different skills despite your profession. That way you do not feel forced to have a particular party or group configuration. You will never feel forced to have a warrior, wizard, cleric, thief type of party configuration. You just need to train in the appropriate skills that are lacking if you wanted to have two melee centered or specialized characters in the party and omit the addition of a rogue type of character you can do that if you train in the right skills now when it comes to the rules themselves they are quite streamlined but at the same time they have that depth to them because of the different spells the skills the abilities so you only need to understand basic concepts such as making attacks making saving rolls and everything else just dovetails or is attached to that now when it comes to magic, it is quite powerful, but it also covers many different areas of expertise. Spellcasters feel specialized in their particular disciplines, but at the same time, they have many resources according to the spells that they are using, so that they feel useful in many different situations. You have spellcasters completely focused on offensive spells, while at the same time they have some defensive and healing capabilities. Now, when it comes to advanced practices, the depth and inspiration taken from real-life occult philosophy is just wonderful. It reinforces the reality of the fiction and adds so much color and flavor so that the advanced practices never feel tedious or like a chore. They feel like a wonderful experiment or mysterious operation that could be your character's lifelong project or even achievement. The equipment, apothecary and alchemical properties sections are extensive, more than enough for many campaigns, and the Atlantean setting provides a solid framework for many adventures to come. And that is without counting the designer's notes section that reveals the logic behind the different choices in Arcanum. So my highest recommendation for the Arcanum 30th Anniversary Edition core rulebook. This is a must-have 
for old school fantasy gamers, in my opinion. Well, thanks for watching my review. If you have any comments or questions, please let me know. And thank you so much to those that have been sending drive through RPG gift certificates to support the channel. If anyone else wants to further support the channel, the information on how to do that will be in the description below. Once again, thank you, and see you later.